Okay. Okay. Uh, welcome everyone to the last lecture out of four. <coughs> and today we are going to continue to talk about spin chains. So before recap, uh, let me, um, from discussions, I understand that uh, I wanted to make a, to, to deliver main message that there are topological terms. By definition, these are terms which do not depend on metric. And there are different topological terms. They're not all the same. The fact that we are dealing with the same integral is just because we consider only spheres to spheres mappings in a very simple setting. And that's why they look alike, but they are very different. Uh, and, and so far we talked about theta terms, which are, uh, which are made out of integer value topological invariants with theta being angle uh, coefficient in front of them, and WZ terms, which are not integer valued, they have trivial variation, so they actually change classical equations of motion, and the coefficient in front of them is integer valued, and that's the quanti quantization of coupling constants. So they are very different, uh, and the only reason they look the same so far is that we used only one simple fact from topology so far is that this is the uh, set of integer numbers. The mappings of n-dimensional sphere into n-dimensional sphere are characterized by integer valued invariants, okay? And form group with respect to addition or multiplication. Uh, one example which is not of this type, for example, is, uh, this is quite non-trivial, that pi four of S3 is actually Z2. It's not so easy to understand, but this is what it is. And uh, therefore, the invariant, which is uh, uh, responsible, takes only two values. Q is either 0 or 1. And you can form a topological term by taking some of the two topological classes with theta Q as a weight. But because this is only 0 and 1, then theta can take only value 0 or pi. There are only two classes. And this topological term was actually used by Tony Skirm in his model of nucleon. He thought about nucleon, proton or neutron, being a soliton in a pine field. But a pine field is bosonic, so he needed to assign statistics and uh, fermionic statistics to this soliton. And it turns out that adding this topological term changes statistics from bosonic to fermionic if coefficient is pi in front. So, and that's what's the original motivation. And this is not straightforwardly related to any Vesumina type. Probably you can construct some uh, mathematical constructions which actually uh, looks, makes it looking alike, but, but it's not really uh, fundamental, okay? So this is uh, just a side comment. Any questions? And um, uh, this is a recap from the last time. This is our zero-dimensional, bless you, Vesumina term, where integration is over disk such that the boundary of this disk is, is our, our time, Euclidean, Euclidean time in this case. The vector n is a unit vector uh, with three components. The vector belongs to S2. And this term is such that its variation is uh, well defined as a function of only n of tau. And also, it's defined up to the modular integer. Therefore, e to the 2 pi i w naught is a well defined object. Uh, and you even can multiply it by an integer number here, and still well defined object. The variation you can compute, yes? Yeah. So this is disk. So I have a disk mapped into a two-dimensional sphere, and that roughly looks like this. Okay. 
But this is because I, so, so the physical part is the mapping of this circle into this sphere, which is this line. That's a physical configuration I'm given. The fact that I took this is my extension. It's because here in the middle I took spin up, okay? So now if I choose different extension and I took middle to be down, and the same configuration on the boundary, I would get this value. And then this, the difference between these terms will be sum of these guys, which will be the integral of a sphere here, which is integer valued invariant. Okay. Therefore, the difference for different extensions is just integer number, which is the degree of mapping of one sphere into another. This is not the wrapping of the sphere. Like right. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. That's Gauss, Gauss degree of mapping. Yeah. Okay. So this is fundamental for us because we will use this formula again and again. So if you haven't uh, derived it yet, please do. It's very easy. Um, and this is the action of any magnet defined on a lattice, right? So what I did is just I replaced every spin on the side of the lattice by unit vector, right? I wrote for each of those unit vectors, I wrote this Zumina zero term, which makes it a quantum spin in the after pass integration. So this gives you such a phase that this n will become quantum spin with proper commutation relations. And then the rest is a just classical Hamiltonian, which is a Hamiltonian of classical vectors on the lattice interacting uh, according to whatever, whatever you write. Okay? So last time we used instead of this H, the Hamiltonian for ferromagnet on the lattice. In, and in that setting, we could think of this N as a smoothly changing field, continuously changing field. And we took continuum limit, and we derived dispersion, which is, was, for ferromagnet, was omega proportional to K squared. Okay? That's where we stopped last time. And we started to talk about quantum antiferromagnet, with the only difference that there is a plus sign here. Therefore, the opposite directions of neighbor ends are preferable. And now N is not smooth field at all, because if you look closely, it, it changes drastically. So we would like to introduce some smooth fields so that we can take continuum limit. Some fields which change very slowly on the lattice scale. And we do it this way. We assume that locally it's a very good antiferromagnet in the classical sense, up and down, up and down, okay? So we decompose this N, saying that it consists of two smooth fields. One is M field, which is basically describes the, the direction of this and the ferromagnetic uh, uh, ordering. And another is the ferromagnetic component, which describes the deviation it from strictly opposite. So if you, for example, have two neighbor spins like this, then together they have overall component here, and this is my L, okay? So I just say that let's do this. And if you look at the constraint that N should be belonging to two-dimensional sphere, you see that if you think of this as much smaller than this, then M squared would be approximately one, and M and L should be approximately orthogonal. But I will replace it for strictly orthogonal, yes. So it's not the parameter A that counts for the small square, so Yes, yes. In fact, uh, at the end, we will see that this A effectively will be one over S, one over S. So this procedure will be justified only if my underlying spin is huge, okay? <coughs> That's very important. This is what basically the, the, main idea, the main idea of Haldane was that you can start with large spin to this continuous derivation, and you still see the difference between half integer and integer spin in the result, as we will see, okay? Any questions about this? Okay, so th there are two parts here. One is to substitute this into Hamiltonian and find continuum limit, and another is to substitute this into this part and find continuum limit. So I gave first part as an exercise, so I just write the result. Uh, it's intuitively obvious, so even if you didn't do this exercise, you probably understand the result. But of course, nothing replaces by 
the, actually doing the exercise. And so far, I'm keeping the dimension of the lattice arbitrary equals D. For now, I will keep magnetic field, but I will drop it eventually. Um, although it comes, comes in very interestingly, but, but we don't have time for that. Okay. Well, this is probably not surprising uh, for, for you if you take this neighbor spins. Uh, so the M looks like, uh, like, like a ferromagnet. And remember, in ferromagnet, we replace the difference of neighbor spins by derivative when we get this term. But in this case, you also, uh, this N and N have common L, and therefore, this L squared. And D comes just because in a cubic lattice in D dimensions, you have many neighbors proportional to D. That's it. Okay? So this is straightforward exercise. What is less straightforward is the manipulation, similar manipulation with topological term, and that's why let's consider this in detail. <coughs> so I start like this. Sum of nj, this is what I need to compute, and I proceed by just substituting, as I said, like this. Now, I remember that my W0 is of third uh, degree in M, right? So when I substitute this, is uh, like made out of the third degree out of this. So I can take minus one to the J outside. Okay. Remember that I would like to think of this as a small one compared to this one. So in the first approximation, I get just W naught of M of X. But I want to do it with a little bit better accuracy. So I have to vary W naught over M and multiplied by delta M, and delta M is minus one to the J, A, L of X. Right. So this is like delta M. Does it make sense? And here I'm already in very continuum limit. Yeah, and one minus one to the J comes from here. So this is minus one to the j essentially squared. So it goes away. And I replace sum by integral here, d dx over a to the power d. And one more thing is the time integral, right? And the integral or D time. Yes. <coughs> Questions. I think I missed the, the, the passage between the first line and the second line. First line and second line? Why, why can we take out the minus one to the J? Well, if you have odd function of x, then f of minus x equals minus f of x. <laughs> no. And and this is n n n. If I change the sign of n, it, it you will get minus sign. Any questions about that? So I use this formula, right? Well, I, I, I did not specifically use this formula. I'm going to use it next step. I'm going to say that delta W naught over delta M is given by one over four pi M dot M. 
So I will use the fact that I know this. This is general so far. So I will continue. Okay, any questions? So let me rewrite this, this term, integral over d dx over a to the d d tau. And now I indeed substitute this one over four pi thing. Should, okay, it's a L of x, one over four pi m dot cross m, and and I think that's it, right? No more coefficients. Good. Okay, that's this term. What about that term? Now, this is very subtle, this one. So remember that in D dimensions, uh, this minus one to the J oscillates in all dimensions that you have, right? So the strategy I will take is the following. I will take the lines of spins in direction X, and I will first perform the, this are uh, continuum limit in one of the chains, and then I sum over other chains, okay? So how do I compute it in one of the chains? I will consider W of M of X plus EX minus W of M of X. So I will take this M plus EX, and this is M. And I will take W node here, W node here. They come with different signs because of this oscillations in X direction. So I just consider this difference. Yes. What, what should come out addition? No, 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 I, I'm, this is variation of this with of N, yes. but here I have of M, so I vary over M. So I just replace N by M, it's, 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 it's dummy variable as Giuseppe was explaining. So uh, here I'm using W node, which is a functional of M, okay? And I want to take variation with respect to M. So I'm just using that formula with n substituted for m. I already substituted n for m, so now I'm using only continuum variables. I don't have n anymore. Okay, so how do I find this difference? Well, yes. So x plus, plus displacement in Tarlegis direction. So basically, I want to take W node at this side and subtract W node at this side. But M changes smoothly between these sides, right? So basically what I want to do here is it's again variation. So I have to take derivative of this, which is DW over delta M again, and multiply it by the change, which is in this case lattice constant, DX, M. And I want to, okay, of course, integrate it over tau. This is what it is. Tell me if there are questions here. And now what I, I do is just substitute here one over four pi m dot m. As I said, I will, I will use this formula quite a lot. So again, using this formula. Of 
Questions? Okay. So, as a result, here we have d d x over a the d d tau a d x m one over four pi m dot plus m. You have to be a little bit more careful because what what I did is I just took this difference. Uh, so, but I, I'm writing it per site, so additional one half comes in, because I have redistributed this difference between this and this. So, so, bit, so I'm, I'm doing this per site. So, additional one half will come in. So, this will be one over eight pi. That's one thing. And another is that this would be for one chain, right? And I still have oscillations between neighbor chains. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No. N, N disappeared. After this, no M. Yeah. Yes. And then the change of M between these two things, which is derivative of M with respect to X. Uh, it, everything, so let, let me remind you the general formula, that if you have a functional, which is a integral of a tau of some, I don't know, Lagrangian of M, then by definition, variation of W, I write this way, integral of notation is this. So this this is what not what this is what is called functional derivative. So you take a variation and the coefficient in front of this variation under the integral is called functional derivative. Say it again. Delta W over delta M times delta M. Integral over tau. Let's assume that I have this. And then I have the same thing, but with slightly different m. Right? The difference of these guys is this. But now, what is slightly different m? This is just the difference of m on the neighbor sides, which is a dx m. And therefore, I put it here. That's, that's basically it. And then I have to sum over ledges, and that's how this integral comes in. OK? So this is what I obtain, almost, because there is still minus um, one to the power difference between neighbor chains. So strictly, I have to write here minus one to the power, all of them except for the x. So for example, in three-dimensional edges, I have jy plus jz here. So I used to have minus one to the power jx plus jy plus jz, but this one, took into account explicitly by this minus sign along the chain. But this one is still there. So I leave it there. OK? Is that clear? Therefore, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, this will cancel in any dimension except for one. Well, it's not strictly canceled because m changes slightly between spin chains as well. But it will be of higher order derivative in gradients. So, so therefore, roughly, I'm saying that this is actually, with my accuracy, zero, unless I'm in strictly one dimension. So I will rewrite this as, OK, I will rewrite this as, I will write this only if dimension is one. Then I can keep this. And in this case, I just write dx over, over a d tau a dx m 1 over 8 pi m dot dot m. OK, yes? Uh, 
Um, how I have a cubic lattice and it oscillates in particular directions. So what would you suggest? Yeah, you could have chosen y direction and then it would, you would have alternating sum and x and z. Yeah, another way to do it would be just to take, okay, let's, let me do this. I get zero anyway. You can do it in gradients, but you will get zero anyway because of these oscillations. Only in one dimensions you get non-zero, in one dimensions you can choose one dimensions. So we can actually avoid this question. If you really want to do it like properly, what you have to do is you have to think about Fourier transforming this M and selecting oscillating component and saying that this is the biggest one and then do it using gradient stuff. But you will get the same because you'll get zero in dimensions except for one and non-zero, which is exactly this in dimension one. Right, so so let, let's, let's skip this. Uh, it will not change much. Uh, but, but there are some choices here. I, uh, it's, it's actually quite interesting. I also, one thing which I also made a choice here is first of all I choose this direction, but also I choose this minus this, right? I, I could have cho chosen this minus this. And that's actually a little bit different. For example, if you had dimerization, if you had, for example, j and j prime, j, j prime, j, j prime, that would matter and that will change the result. But, but, but anyway, so. Uh, I, I suggest you, I'll give you this as an exercise at the end. <coughs> Check that. Okay, so this is what I have. So I'll just write this as one dimensional case. So let me now summarize what we get. And write full action. We still need one more step of importance. So the action of M and L of two continuous fields is equal to I S over two delta D one D tau DX DX M M dot D tau M plus j s squared a squared a to the power two minus d actually one half integral d tau d x to the power d d mu m squared Okay, <coughs> so this term is absent unless I'm in one dimension. So in general dimension, this is what I have. Uh, fortunately, L enters only here and here, right? And what I can do is I can integrate out L. So at this point, my pass integral is pass integral over M field and L field and e to the minus action, this action. And L enters quadratically, so it's very easy to integrate it out. Okay? I suggest you to do this exercise. It's not as trivial as you might think from the very beginning, because remember that M times L is zero, so L is not arbitrary field, but it's supposed to be always orthogonal to M. So when you're integrating it out, you really have to remember that. The way to do it is to add lambda times ML as Lagrange multiplier to this action 
integrate it out, find the optimal lambda, and so on and so forth. So use saddle point integration and integrate it out. And now I'm going to write the result of this integration. So S of M equal. And, and let me write the result first in uh, D bigger than one dimensions. So when this term is not important. So it will be one over two G. I, I change notations. By and coupling constant G is 2 divided by S square root of dimension. Um, you, well, I, I dropped H. This is for H equals zero. Uh, try to do it with H. It's very interesting how H enters. Because H interacts non-trivially with M because M is a ferromagnetic vector. It's not ferromagnetic. So H was trivially interacting with L. But with M, it's a little bit more complicated. So uh, this is my action as a function of staggered magnetization M. And there are quite a lot of things to learn here. For example, this is a typical propagation of the uh, velocity of propagation of the excitations. Namely, you get linear dispersion omega equals Vs times K. And this is famous dispersion for magnets in the ferromagnet. And this is uh, spin wave velocity, which is given explicitly by this. Okay? Then the next comment is very interesting, is that if you think about in terms of phases on how this behaves, then Vs is not important because you can make change of variables tau prime equals Vs times tau. So you say, let's measure time and space in the same units in meters. So therefore, use instead of tau, use tau prime, which is this. You make this change of variables. You have one Vs coming from here, two Vs is coming from here, and all Vs will be gone from the, here. And, and you will get just relativistically invariant d mu m squared, where mu now will include time. Here it's only space. Okay? This is like putting c equals 1, which people do in relativistic field series. This is our speed of light for this case. So Vs is not really that important. So phase diagram and, and what's going on does not depend on the value of Vs. It's just scale of time versus space depends. However, this g is important part. It's, a, it's, it's called coupling constant. Uh, if G is large, that means that gradients do not cost much. And system kind of gets disordered more. Fluctuations are uh, increased if G is big. Okay? And you can see this G enters like temperature in, in partition function. So if you increase temperature, fluctuations increase. If G is small, and this is the only, uh, the only occasion when this derivation makes any sense, if G is small, then these guys are uh, gradients are small, and this staggered magnetization does not change much on the lattice scale. And then I could have used my approximation that n equals just staggered magnetization plus small ferromagnetic component. <laughs> Otherwise, I would not be able to, to do that. So all this action is justified only when G is much smaller than 1. Okay. If you now look at the formula for G, that's very interesting because you see that it's justified, for example, when spin is large. When spin is large, the, uh, the uh, spins, quantum spins, behave almost like classical errors, and you can, fluctuations are small, and you can do that. Or G is small when dimension is large. 
which actually known results that if you have large dimension, then each spin surrounded by many others, and this spin uh, feels the effective field created by other spins averaged over them. And if there are many of them, mean field is a very good approximation, and this spin uh, doesn't fluctuate too much. So you basically can justify this derivation both by S large and, and, and D large. Yes? I Work with this if you want. No, no, it's, it's really, uh, at this point, it really doesn't matter. Here is a legitimate nice action in terms of M and L. I just want to see what happens with staggered magnetization. And, and for me, it's simpler to work with this. So integrate it out. But you could have studied all, all, every question which I will, uh, will want to address. You can study in this, in this uh, action as well. But here you have to remember about this constraint in addition to M squared equals 1. It's already M squared equals 1 is already kind of headache here. But, but ML equals 0 in addition. To, yeah, but you can do that. It's not a problem. So this is more like for convenience. OK. Now, let me go to, oh, by the way, let me make s some side remark, uh, uh, because I'm not sure that if you didn't work with quantum magnetism, you might not know what actually is the cause of all problems in, in antiferromagnets. So suppose that, let me consider the example, this is like side remark. Suppose that I have spin one and spin two which interacts, this is Hamiltonian, S1 times S2. So this is like antiferromagnet with two spins, okay? And suppose the spins are one half. So S is one half. What do you think is the ground state of this Hamiltonian? Hmm? So if you take this configuration up and down, then it's easy to compute the energy up, down. So the energy is minus J over four. Okay? However, somebody mentioned singlet. If you consider this configuration, superpositions of up, down, and down, up, then the energy is minus three quarters J, which is much, much lower, okay? This is exercise. Do it. OK, now we have problem. So if I have two spins like this, no problem. This is the ground state. It's a singlet. But if you have many spins, then if you make singlet out of these two, you cannot make singlet out of these two anymore. So you might want to make singlet like this. But then you completely lose the, the advantage here. So here you get minus 3 quarters j for these two. But these are totally un uncorrelated, so you'll get 0 here energy. While if you put it like this, nail state, then you get minus j over 4, but from all of those. Okay? This is still better for spin 1 half. But maybe there is something better than this, OK? And there is something better than this. And also, for larger spins, it becomes even, even more weight. If spin is really huge, then this is, this is the best way. Because you cannot, this, well, you, you have to think about it. Just think about this for two spins where spin is large. And you will see that the difference between singlet or whatever quantum superposition state and totally anti-aligned states becomes smaller and smaller. And because this one is not, frust this, this state is not frustrating, that's the term, meaning that if I have a chain, I can do this for every pair of sides, and there is no problem. While this one is frustrating because I can do it for these spins, I can do it for this, but I cannot do for this anymore. So you really have to compromise between singlet being the better state for two spins and between having many spins. So you have to find the best, and, and that, therefore, uh, the ground states of quantum antiferromagnets is a complicated question. 
Okay. So this is just to 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 explain why we 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 do not think that this is trivial stuff. It's it's it will, it will be complicated. Okay. So now, <coughs> sorry, my voice is really okay. Now let me write our expression for d equals one, combining what we have before. Now it's especially elegant. So this is one over two g integral p tau d x one over v s d tau m squared plus v s d mu m squared plus i theta And the values of parameters are Vs equals 2S AJ and G equals 2 over S and theta equals 2 pi S. And this is the famous result of Haldane of 83. Any questions so far? So if you assume that this m at infinity is look up, so in some particular direction, then this is just integer number. Or if you assume that this is defined on a closed surface, then this is just integer number. So this is precisely our topological term. So tell me which one, theta term or Vesumina term? Huh? Say that, say that, right. right. This is integer value term with angle coefficient, right? Well, what values does angle take here in this particular case? The S underlying spin can only be integer or half integer. So this theta is either multiple of 2 pi or multiple of pi, okay? If it's multiple of 2 pi, then this is like e to the i 2 pi times integer number, and in the weight, in the Boltzmann weight, in the partition function, this disappears. So we expect, naive, naively, that S integer, topological term, not important. Okay? But we do expect that when it's S is half integer, then Topological term in the action can be written as e to the i 2s times pi times q equals minus 1 to power q. So it gives you interference between sectors with integer winding number, with, with um, odd winding numbers and even winding numbers. So there is some cancellations. In, 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 a, in, a, in a partition function. And that might lead to important effects. Okay? Any questions so far? So Haldane boldly conjectured at this point uh, that if you take a Heisenberg chain, which means J S I S J with spin S, uh, and derivation, remember, is only for S large. So, but he said that if you take this Heisenberg chain with large S, which is integer, then you can drop this and you come back to this thing which is called O3 nonlinear sigma model, which was known to be massive. So there is a gap in spectrum correlation functions decay exponentially. I'll talk about it a little bit more, okay? So he said, for any integer S, Heisenberg chain is in a state where there is a gap in the spectrum separating ground state from excitations. But if S is half integer, the only thing by that time was known that if you take Heisenberg model with spin equals one half, then that was solved by Beta in 1931, and uh, exact result is known by Beta and Zatz. And 
it's massless. It has massless excitation. So Haldane said that if S is half integer, Z by RG flows, it goes and flows to this massless uh, system. So in this sense, the value of this theta term is absolutely crucial. Theta half integer means massless system with low energy excitations. Theta being 2 pi times integer means that there is uh, mass in the spectrum. Okay. Now I skip a lot of stuff. So, yeah, questions? Yes. Uh, let, let, let me say a few words about what was known and what is known about this. Uh, one particularly bold uh, assumption of Haldane was that even for S equals 1, which is not large S at all, he assumed that for Heisenberg chain with spin 1, the system is in the state with a gap separating ground state from the excitation. And this was confirmed numerically in, in many other ways. Okay? So this turns out to be true, but this was really not based on, on, on you, cannot, you cannot make this uh, uh, conclusion because it's beyond the applicability of this expansion, yes. But um, a basic question, why do we actually do this piece where minus x, x is very large in the equation? That's a good question. Remember that I expanded this n into m and l, and first of all, I assumed that this m and l both smoothly varying fields. Secondly, I assume that L is much smaller than 1, and they are, therefore they are orthogonal. All of this uses the fact that everything changes smoothly. If this G is of the order of 1, then this guy, within this theory, fluctuates a lot. So fluctuations diverge. So therefore, you expect that neighbor spin actually are not interparallel at all, but they do like this. Yeah, yeah. The, the idea is the following, that to have self-consistent derivation of this type, G in the answer should be small. If G in the answer appears to be small, then I'm saying that my assumptions are sort of justified. Okay? But if G turns out, turns out to be large, and we'll, we'll see what one, one additional thing about G. Yes? <coughs> The question is what you integrate over here. If you integrate over sphere or over plane but with the boundary conditions that n looks up at the boundary, then this is integer valued. If you integrate not assuming, if you integrate over some piece, not assuming that this uh, uh, has particular value but arbitrary, this is half of the solid angle. This is solid angle of, of the boundary. So it has nothing to do with integer. Yeah, here I'm saying that I have a plane and I have a time, and I assume that what something happens here, but boundary conditions is always up in the infinity. So I'm looking what happens at the local excitations of this. And then this, I integrate this over whole plane and get integer number all the time. In, in that, when the zoom in appeared, I have only one dimensional n moving, and it was moving in an arbitrary way and, and doing solid angle. And integrations there, was happening only over uh, over the disk such that the boundary was n moving in arbitrary way. Therefore, this was not quantized. Yeah. Yes? Say it again? Yes. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm talking about uh, these are called uh, the configurations characterized by given Q uh, sometimes called instantons in this, in this uh, because they are actually space-time configurations and it's not in space. Okay. So, so let me review quickly uh, this nonlinear sigma model. Well, review is too strong word, actually. I will be oversimplifying things, but... Nevertheless, I have to say a few words. So, 
So, this is what I have. 1 over 2g, integral d2x, d mu m squared, plus i theta q. Where q is 1 over 4 pi, integral d2x, m times d tau m dx m. Okay? So this is called O3 nonlinear sigma, uh, sorry, nonlinear sigma model with topological term. Okay? So let's remember what we know without topological term first. So, and, and uh, let's assume that G is much smaller than one. So that I have a good definition that this is weak coupling limit, the M is almost, it's, 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 it's not fluctuating to start with, but then we want to look at the system at bigger and bigger distances and see what effectively happens with this model to see whether there is long range order or not. We actually know that there should not be long range order because this is, this Merman Wagner theorem tells me that there is no spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, in, 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 in one dimension. Uh, so, uh, and this was clarified by Polikov. in 75, before conformal field theory. And uh, what he showed is that if you do RG analysis of this, renormalization group analysis, then G, if you, even if you start with small values, G, you start with small values, G will grow. He derived RG equation and G grows. And there is no fixed point at small g. So there is no such thing that it goes and then stops and then you can define good continuum limit around here, so on and so forth. It just continues to flow as long as you calculate. But remember that RG is actually perturbative. It's a smart way of dealing with perturbation theory, but you can do next RG step only if current G is small, much smaller than one. So you cannot go beyond one, okay? You can renormalize, this G will change at bigger scale and it will grow. But you cannot, naively it can go, go to infinity, but at, at the order of one, it basically, it, it diverges and it's, it's it, uh, perturbation theory does not work anymore. You cannot just continue, okay? So first of all, just qualitatively, growing G means like disordering system more and more. So even if you start with model which is well aligned and G is small at the lattice scale and you look at this at bigger and bigger scale, it will fluctuate more and more. So, and this is like destruction of the long range order which, which is due to Mervyn Wagner theorem in particular. Uh, and the question is, what is this scale at which, up to which I can actually use this? And you can compute this from, this, from RG equations which Polikov derived. So G is of the order of one, is actually at the scale psi, which is given by formula two pi over n minus two G. Here n is the number of components of, of this field. Polikov did it for general case. Uh, we are interested in n equals three. Uh, and we're interested in G equals two divided by S. That's what we derived as a bare coupling constant. So, so this becomes E to the pi S. Yes? How to derive it? Uh, we'll, okay. Very rough sketch is as usual with RG. What you are doing, you say that uh, let's take M and replace it by M, which is slow, 
plus fluctuation delta m, which is fast. Okay? So you assume that for every m I can select uh, this m has a Fourier component k bigger than some lambda minus b lambda, and lambda where lambda is, uh, is the lattice scale, ultraviolet cutoff. And then in the functional integral, in a smart way, you have to integrate out this fast component, rescale scale so that this lambda minus the lambda becomes lambda again, so you're back to, to original uh, scale, and see how g changed, okay? In this case, this is very difficult because uh, of this constraint that m squared equals one. So if you just look at this, this is like free theory where uh, like if you do Fourier transform, it's like k squared mk squared, so all Fourier components do not talk to each other, but they do because of this constraint. And this is what Polikov did. This is absolutely genius paper. It's two pages. <laughs> two pages and three lines, um, three references or something like that. And in these two pages, he derived not only how G flows, but also how correlation length uh, changes, uh, how, how um, correlation function changes in time, and so on and so forth. So try to study this. It's not easy reading because uh, there are some subtleties, but this is, idea of RG is very, is, very, is very general and it's always like this. So you just separate your field into slow, fast, you integrate out fast, and you see what's the effective field theory for slow, and you see uh, what's the change of coupling constant. Hopefully, the effective field theory for slow will be, again, of the same type, but with a little bit different coupling constant. Then you can talk about RG flow uh, meaningfully. Well, anyways, anyway, so, so he did that, and this is the result, that, that G grows, and it becomes of the order of one at this length in, 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 in the units of, of lattice spacing. If S is large, this is pretty large length. So the picture is that within this length, this M is ordered, but then it starts decaying. And naively, if you do not do any additional assumptions, that the most natural decay is e to the minus x of psi. This is for correlation functions. So the most natural decay of correlation functions, namely n of zero, n of x, the most natural assumption is this. But important thing to understand is that we actually do not know this from RG, okay? From RG, we just know that there is some scale at which something might happen. Either gap opens in the spectrum, and then it's this result, or something else, and that's its different result. So, so basically, so we stop here, and, and, uh, and this argument so far doesn't have to do anything with the term. It's so far the same. So up to this, we believe that it flows the same way with or without topological term. But what happens next is, is a question. So let's have this uh, five minute break and then, and then we continue from this point, okay? Okay, let me continue <coughs> with my review. <coughs> hmm. Uh, okay, uh, first of all, comment that, uh, that here when we estimated correlation, well, correlation lengths, the scale at which coupling constant becomes of the order of one, yeah, I, I was asked, and that's true, this uh, G is a bare coupling constant at the latest scale, right? Which is two divided by S as we derived. So this is not running but if you have a bare coupling constant, it defines you the scale in, through this formula uh, at which length uh, fluctuations becomes big. When fluctuations becomes big, our derivation of the model and RG and everything becomes not applicable anymore and we don't know what happens beyond that. You really have to uh, uh, take some other arguments. This was done for model without topological term in 85 when Wigman solved this model exactly using beta ensembles, okay? And he found that there is a gap in the spectrum, there is mass, correlation functions decay exponentially with, with roughly this, uh, this exponent, okay? So this is like a confirmation. 
But then the question is what to do with this, with nonlinear signal model. And uh, what was known is that for spin equals one half, so we do not talk about sigma model for spin one half, because for spin one half, as you can see, the coupling constant is four, not small at all. So we really cannot talk about uh, sigma model in that case. Our derivation is absolutely not applicable. But for Heisenberg chain, you still can talk about Heisenberg chain, um, sigma i, sigma i plus one, given by this Hamiltonian. And it was known from data 31 is that there are massless excitations in this chain with linear spectrum and, and the ground state is not separated by gap. So it's completely different class from, from nonlinear sigma model. Okay. And then I already said in 83, Haldane derived this action uh, using this semi-classical approach, assuming that S is much bigger than one. And he noticed that although if S is bigger than one and this is nonlinear sigma model with small coupling constant, but this topological term, if spin is half integer, still gives you plus minus ones, non-trivial interference between different sectors, which is not small. So it's not like that if you have S large, then this effect is not important. It's still there. It's only important whether S is integer or half integer. So Haldane boldly conjectured that if S is integer, this does not matter at all, and it's always in the gapful phase. And if S is half integer, that something changes, and by some reason after that scale, you go to algebraic decay, not instead of, instead of uh, uh, exponential decay. Okay? And uh, he did a conjecture for that Heisenberg chain, SISJ, precisely is, uh, belongs to one, one of these two classes. For integer S, it has a gap. For half integer, it doesn't have a gap, and that's called Kaldane's conjecture. Well, strictly speaking, it's not based on, on I mean, you, you, could, you actually can deform this chain in such a way that these all arguments almost do not change, but, but you will have massless phases and everything else. So this was indeed conjecture that for Heisenberg chain, this is happening, and this was some sort of semi-classical justification in comparison with known results before. But this basically, for now, it's, it's considered to be confirmed that, that indeed for Heisenberg chains, you have this two types of behavior. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about something very confusing. Uh, and I'm not just confusing for me, also for me as well, but generally very confusing. And uh, let me try to do this picture, which is RG flow for nonlinear sigma model with topological term. So I'll make some picture which does not make any sense except for, uh, I don't know, for philosophical value. Well, it, it does make sense, but it's, it's, to make sense out of this picture is complicated. So let me consider two parameter space, where here I will plot theta divided by two pi, and here I will plot one over g, okay? So theta divided by two pi can be zero, one, two, or one half, three halves, etc. And if I'm talking about nonlinear sigma model, I'm on this on this line. Theta is zero, and I I am somewhere here. And this one over g is remember s over two. And I assume that S is large, the coupling constant is large, so I'm really high up here. This is, so large spins are somewhere there. Yes? So it's going to be bare coupling constant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I put my starting point as bare and then I will flow. Okay. Yeah, so when I'm saying that, I'm always starting somewhere up there. If I'm talking about spin chains, which can be derived, I'm, I'm talking somewhere here. So now, for the linear sigma model, I start here, and as I Polykov showed, you have a flow like this. Somewhere here, g of the order of one, and we actually do not know what's going on here, but you might pictorially say, 
Okay, but we know from exact solution that actually it's getting disordered more and more and more. So let me just naively throw it like this. And I'm saying that this, my fixed point is when G is infinite, infinite temperature. So everything is destroyed at large scales. No order. Okay, then Haldane tells us the same story should be everywhere here and here. In the same sense, so after this point, we actually cannot tell anything, but if we do the same type of picture, we do this, okay? What if spin one half or half integer? And we think that there is some massless state. Massless means that you have some point where G is not infinite yet. It's some finite G. So you have maybe decay, but it's not completely disordered states. So you, you think that you go somewhere like this and, and somewhere here you have a fixed point. Okay. And now the question is, and, and the same for other half integers. If I believe that theta is periodic, then I should write just these things. In spin chains, it's not clear that you should be, have, well, anyway, so, so something like this, and you, you the question is how to continue, what, what happens, and the, suppose what, what, suppose I start here. So I start with small coupling constant, large spin, but theta is not precisely one half. First of all, question, can I do this microscopically? Can I find spin chain, which is like that? And yes, you can. And for this, you have to take slightly dimerized spin chain, and let me formulate my exercise for you. The exercise is the following. Suppose that I have Hamiltonian, which is sum over k, jk, sk, sk plus one. So this is exercise. And jk equals j, which is bigger than zero if k is even, and equals j prime, also bigger than zero, if k is odd. So I essentially have spin chain, but it's our exchange intervals of j, j prime, j, j prime, etc. The rest is, is the same. And my exercise is uh, repeat all we did today and derive nonlinear sigma model and its parameters for this spin chain. And you will find effective spin velocity, you will find effective coupling constant, and you will find effective theta. And the answer is the theta, effective theta is 2 pi s, 1 minus demerization. So if j is precisely j prime, as we considered, then this is just uh, just zero, and you have 2 pi s, as, as, as we did. But if j is not equal to j prime, you, you will start with theta, which is slightly off 2 pi s. <coughs> okay, so I start here, and I do rg. And miraculously, nothing in arg argument of Polyakov is sensitive to, to, to theta term. Because when you do rg, you basically have to integrate out something to get effective action. But if this something is integer, integer number, then no matter what you do, it's, it's the integer number, so it doesn't affect your, your uh, RG flow at all. So you would basically predict that RG flow is like this all the time. Okay? Yes? The, the RG flow for this G, GG over D log L is G squared over some coefficient testing, something like 2 pi. It says Polykov's for G. Okay. And theta does not enter. Well, Polykov did not do it for theta, but if you just repeat these arguments, I mean, theta cannot enter <coughs> because it's, it's coefficient in front of integer, which does not change. Okay? But, but you find it in this two-page paper by Polykov, so. Very clearly written there. 
so then the, there was the idea which actually was put first in quantum hole context. And in quantum hole, the diagram is absolutely the same, except that here it's sigma xx, longitudinal conductivity, and it's sigma xy. So, and this diagram in quantum hole effect was drawn by hand by David Hmelnitsky and, and then uh, was derived using instantons, uh, instanton approach by Pruiskin and, and collaborators. Okay, I'll, I can give you references. So, what they found, well, what Dima draw and, and Pruiskin found by instanton computation is that the right way to think about it would be like this. So there is a stable, there is a fixed point for, to which flow goes here, but if you deviate from it, somehow it, it gets disordered. And if you're here and compute slight, small, very small instanton corrections, and there is a very confusing uh, whether it's valid and how, I mean, it's, it's, it's complicated, sorry, but what you find is something like this. There is, there is a small deviation, there is a small deviation in this. So the belief is that it goes like this. So that if you start with the model which is not precisely at this line, then you eventually end up with, with, with a gapful state, which is And there is a reason to believe that. Uh, I will explain you some other point of view which kind of justifies this overall picture. But what I'm trying to say is that this picture, you can draw it, but you don't understand clearly what it is. Because when you are already here, and this happens at g of the order of one, you really, the sigma model cannot be written. So the right way to think about it, in whole effect, it's, it's more clear. You basically say that there are, there are uh, observables, sigma xx and sigma xy, which you can measure. And you can take the sample of a particular size, measure these observables, put a point here, then increase the size of the sample, measure observables, take an x point, and draw it. And, and the belief it goes like this. In that case, you can say that this is not actually RG flow. Actually, in quantum pole effect, you can also derive a nonlinear sigma model with topological term. The story is the same. That's why it's not accidental that pictures are the same. But you say that you, I don't believe my sigma model anymore when I'm here, but I still can think about observables and how they change when I scale my system. And then the question is, of course, what is this point? So I have obviously some massless state, some critical phase. If you have some critical phase, you probably have some conformal field theory there. CFT. So this kind of nice wrap up because it gives you connection with, with Giuseppe's lectures. So you should have been able to say what CFT here and study near this point in totally different language than Sigma model, the critical behavior of the CFT. And it was done by Affleck and Haldane. Let me see, I, I think I have here. Yeah. yeah, this was 87. And they identified this point as this Zumina Witten model at the level k equals one. And this Zumina Witten model is the sigma model written in terms of different variable with topological with the miniature. So this is quite remarkable. I have, I start with the half integer, half, well, pi value of theta term in topological theta term in sigma model. I do RG flow and my critical point is described by this Zumina written model uh, with, with some particular coefficient. Okay. Anyway, so as this is just to show you how, how uh, let, let me, uh, I will have one more ingredient, but let me describe what we, what we did. We said, let's take one spin. The effective theory for one spin is the zumina witten model of zero dimension, right? Uh, then take a lot of these spins in anti-ferromagnetic order, sum them properly, take continuum limit, and you get spin chain model, which is nonlinear sigma model with theta term. So this the zuminas chemically combined produce use uh, theta term. Say the term in one dimensional theory. That was in zero dimensional, now it's one dimensional. Now we take, at three coupling this model with non trivial say the term, let it flow, and it comes out with 
one-dimensional uh, nonlinear sigma model with less zoomina written term, but already one-dimensional. We, we should write it in terms of matrix. So you see how, how these terms kind of play around, and 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 this is uh, that's particular the reason for confusion because because all these terms are given more or less by the same formula, but you integrate is all all space or part of the space, and and it's is a circle or sphere. Anyway, it's it's very close, but this is but they're actually different physically, but they do talk to each other. So that's one of the things which I wanted to illustrate with these lectures. And another I will show now yet another relationship between Vesumina and, and, and Seda term, which actually leads to some experimental consequence, which is quite non-trivial. Okay, any questions so far? So this part is very confusing, and trust me, if you look at this instant on calculations, there is always a question whether you are within uh, limits of your apl applicability. Um, Art Prowskin wrote a lot of papers trying to clarify this issue, and he did to some point, but I, st I, s I still think that it's not really fully uh, developed story. And um, more recently, in the 90s and, and beginning of 2000s, Lukyanov, the Malochik of Fateyev, uh, actually did some exact results of nonlinear sigma model with pi theta term. So, so there are some justification for all this uh, from sigma model point of view as well. Okay. Oh, oh, by the way, just about, uh, about, uh, about terminology, this flow of the weak coupling to the strong one at long distances, it's called asymptotic freedom or oh, infrared catastrophe. And, and this is the reason in QCD why we have confinement. So it's, the coupling constant goes to infinity when we go to large scales. Yes. But uh, this particular theta yes. was, also, was also supposed to mean something in QCD, so that the uh, capital theta flows in a random set in the field. Right, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I know less about QCD. In QCD, there is this uh, problem of uh, strong CP violation, right? Uh, that in QCD, you generally can write term of the type theta f where f is this, well, the, where the topological term in, in terms of the gauge field strength. And because you are allowed to write it, then the question is why in our world this theta is so close to zero that we don't see it. Because if you write something here like pi or, or even point 0.1, you will see a lot of uh, uh, symmetry breaking, CP symmetry breakings. But, but, but it, we don't see it, so theta is very close to zero, and the question is why, and in particular this flows is, is possible explanation, and axions and all this comes here, but I'm not qualified to discuss it. What is the situation of kappa equals one? Kappa, I didn't, k equals one, k equals one? yeah. Why, why is this particular, I mean, why does k equals one arise? Um, K is 2S, and S is one half of this particular line. No, no, I didn't. So I did not write one dimensional with the Minovitan model with K equals one. I'm just saying that this K, remember, we in Vesuminovitan models, we have coefficient in front of Vesumina terms quantized. Yes. In this particular case, it's one for spin one half. It's, uh, but it's not so trivial, thanks you for asking, because if you start with spin three halves, you would naively expect that this k is, 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 is three, uh, but it turns out that it is not, uh, because in spin chains there are a lot of other perturbations, and as a result, there is a k, k equals three Vesumina Witten point, but it only exists if you fine tune coefficients so that you're in exactly solvable limit of three half spin chain. You have to really adjust Hamiltonian. It's not Heisenberg anymore. But for Heisenberg, this point uh, of RG is unstable. You do not hit exactly this point. You go around and then you go and you end up with K equals one point as well. I, I will try to explain chemically why it happens in a very naive chemical way. And, and it actually explains a lot of things. Uh, okay. So first, before doing that, let me give you some very interesting uh, uh, computation which can be done like this, like, like an exercise. So suppose that I have a theta term, which remember is 2 pi s, uh, that's my theta, 
integral of 1 over 8 pi epsilon mu nu n d mu n d nu n integrate over space time. Okay? And remember, we were talking about that, that if I integrate over compact space, for example, sphere here, then this term is always integer valued, and you end up with this 2 pi s times, times integer value, and there is i here. Okay? Now, let's suppose that I have a spin chain which is finite of the length L. Let's, let's call it topological term. And now my question is, what is topological term for some configuration of n of x and tau, which is defined on, on a strip, right? You have L in, in space and, and time flows this way. So what will happen? It's not integer anymore, right? So what is it going to be? Anyone can guess? Half integer. It's actually more complicated than that. <laughs> this is integer, uh, which describes the wrapping number of configuration of n fields or space time around n, n fields, uh, target space, right? So it's something like this. Oh, let, let me do it. So this is n1 of tau. n1 is a spin on the leftmost side. <coughs> then you have n2 of tau. Uh, sorry, not n2, but nl of tau, where nl is a spin on the rightmost side. And I'm computing the degree of mapping, which used to be when this guy would coincide with this, so this would be just this area of this sphere multiplied by some number. But now I'm doing this. I'm computing this area. And this area is what, what this gives me, right? Isn't it? It almost is. So let me let me do this. Let me compactify time. So time goes like this, and this is from zero to L. So this is effectively my space time, and I have a mapping of this into this. So it's just it's the same. Okay. Right. And remember that this thing is Jacobian of transformations of variables. So essentially, when I'm integrating here, I'm actually counting the area here. So, well, it, it did depend. So, okay, so I have something like this. And the right way to just tell that what this value is, is the following. is just I theta. Theta is 2 by S as before. Times the solid angle of the left spin well, I should call it left and right. Oh, no, okay. Good, good. Left, L is L, not left. Plus maybe some integer number uh, if, if this thing in addition wraps several times. Okay? And then minus the spin number one. So let's go like this. Uh, Q is a degree of mapping. You still, uh, if, if this were sphere, so you would just wrap Q times. But now you kind of open it up. So it's roughly this, but maybe plus additional integer number of wrappings. So this is generic. I will throw it away. It's not, will be important for me, but, but, but you, you see, right? I want to map this into this. Well, it gives me something like this with mapping of this giving one side and mapping of this giving me the other side. But also within this, it can wrap around the sphere many times. 
So suppose Q times. So the answer is given by just this. Okay? Now suppose that S is integer. And in this case, Haldane told us that for, for this uh, bulk system, for spin chain, you can forget about theta term. Because if S is integer and th this is integer, then it's always e to the i2 pi n. Forget about it. But now it's not so simple because there is this still coefficient here, which, which has this. Right? You can forget in this case about q. Because if this is 2 pi times integer, and this is integer, then q goes away as before. But you still have this configuration for left spin and right spin left over in phase, yes? Think of this as, uh, so this area equals to this area minus this area. And this is what I'm writing. So which area is omega L then? Or, or, omega L is area from the North Pole to, to an L, this one. Okay, omega, one is omega 1 is this area. And then to get this one, you have to take difference. This is one of those questions that you really have to, to, to think about it, and it will be easier than, than if I will be trying to explain it. Any questions? So now, let me say that, OK, I, now the argument is the following. I have a spin chain with theta being 2 pi, or times integer. I know that in the bulk, According to Haldane and experimental evidence, the bulk is gapful. So no dynamics in the bulk. I'm going to low energies, so I just throw away bulk. I forget about bulk. Then the only thing which is left is this and this. The rest is gone. This d mu m squared, because it was gapful, does not produce me low-lying excitations. So everything here is gone. So the only action which is left is this. And I ask you, if I look at the action, which is e to the i, let's take s equals 1. Then this will be just 2 pi times omega, say, left, L over 4 pi, which is e to the i omega L divided by 2. My question is, have you seen this action where and what it is? So I have action of just one unit vector, which goes around and pick up the face, which is the half of the solid angle. What is this? Somebody should guess. One spin. One spin. It's the action of one spin. What is the value of that spin? One half. One half. One half. So prediction. You take a Heisenberg spin chain with spin once. And at the left end, you will see effectively spin one half. This is absolutely mind-blowing, I have to tell you. Because think about it. So I have spins, one, out of which I make spin chain. So I put here spin one, 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 etc. If I take two spin ones, what can I get if I add two spin ones? I can get singlet, zero spin. I can get, well, the way to write it is probably like this, right? I can get. I can get, which, which spins can I get combining two spin ones? Zero, one, and two. So one, two, okay? So only integer. So I'm having integer spins, 
And what I'm saying is that if you look in your experimental device, you put magnetic field here as this left end, then at very low energies, you will see as if there is spin one half living here. So somehow out of infinitely many spin ones, I formed spin one half. This is like fractionalization. I broke spin into two, which is absolutely not possible if you think about it. Uh, Charlie Kane recently wrote a news, uh, his article in the newsletter of Simon Center for Geometry and Physics, which is called Splitting the Indivisible. This is one of the examples of splitting the indivisible. This is a popular article, but I suggest there are many examples there. So, of course, no contradiction. I just did not create one spin one half, but there is another spin one half on the other side. And if you take two spin one halves and combine them, you can get either zero or one. So it's integer again. So there is no really contradiction. But somehow, if you flip spin in the middle, you can only get spin magnons, which have spin one, which is which, which are in, integer value spin excitations. But somehow, what it does is that because of this gap, it splits this, and you have instead two spin one half excitations at the different ends. So you cannot really take spin one and split it, but having infinitely many spins, you can separate it into, into two different sides of the spin chain. This is an example of this. And this is really like half a line uh, idea of which shows you how it actually happens in terms of topological phases. Okay, any questions here? So one more thing is that I started with state term and at, 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 at the boundary, it gave me the Zumina term again. So it's one more connection. Yes? Uh, if it's finitely many, then this spin one half is actually interacting with this spin one half a little bit. So they actually, uh, there is a spin one half on this side, the spin one half on this side. With this interaction, they want to be in singlet or, or triplet depending on even odd number of sides. So essentially, if you look at really spectrum, the, the, uh, these two spin one half states will be split. But that splitting is like e to the minus gap L divided by mass, uh, so which, which is really exponentially small with the length. So strictly speaking, to have free spin one half, you need half infinite chain or infinite. But if you have finite one, we, you can split that with very good accuracy. Good question, yeah. If, if S is any integer, then from this naive argument, you would expect spin S divided by two at the end. And because of the similar reasons which I explained when I considered flow, the most of this, so if spin is S is integer, if it's even integer, then this is just integer spin, and of course you will not be able to distinguish it for once at all. If it's half integer, uh, sorry, if it's odd one, for example, nine, then you may really think of nine halves, but this is four and a half. And four will be again kind of absorbed and, and you will not observe it. So RG will not be stable there, but, but you will have again one half. I, again, I'm, I'm, tr I'm still trying to get it to the chemical picture of how it actually happens. No, no, gap. We're talking about integer spin. Integer spin. If it's half integer, think, think what can happen in half integer. In half integer, it's more complicated because you don't have this first part of the argument when I said that forget about bulk. Uh, it's it's, it's um, uh, because it's gapful and you have only part of the, the, the other stuff will matter. But in half integer, it's not also crazy because in half integer, what happens is that tend to have demerization and then you will have spin one half at one side, but not on the other. But anyway, but I will, I'll come back to this after my other illustration. Any questions? Okay. Um, Andrea, I have traditional request for you. Yeah, just tell me when I have to stop. Like 20 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, 
So there is one idea which helps you to believe part of this story, which is called AKLT model. AKLT stands for Affleck Kennedy Lip Tasaki. And what they did is that they suggested forget about Heisenberg model for, for a moment and consider the following model instead. H equals 2J, sum of J. So again, I have spin chain with spins living at the sides of the spin. Of the spin is one. S is one. Okay, you can do generalizations for other spins as well, but spin is one. But instead of Heisenberg model, I consider this model, where P two is a projector to total spin equals two. Remember that when you have two spins, you the sum of these two spins can be zero, one, or two. So let's suppose that I find some expression such that when it's two, then it's, it's, it doesn't change it. And when it's one or zero, it kills it, okay? So first of all, what is the explicit expression for this projector? This is very nice exercise. Uh, and the answer is this. It's one half SJ, SJ plus one, plus one six SJ times SJ plus one squared, plus one third. Well, one third will not matter for us too much. It's just a constant. But you see that this is roughly Heisenberg chain, but perturbed by this uh, by linear uh, by quadratic part, right? So this is not quite Heisenberg Hamiltonian Haldane conjectured about. But this is like one six. One six is a really small number compared to one half. So we might try to believe that maybe uh, this Hamiltonian is in the same phase as Heisenberg Hamiltonian. In any case, it would be interesting to, to study, study this model. Why not? Okay, we, we, we do not know. Uh, usually when you derive problems microscopically, there are a lot of terms, not necessarily this, but this is also possible. This term is, by the way, is not possible for spin one half. Think about it, why? But for spin one, this is allowed term. And for spin three halves, even this cubed is allowed, and so on and so forth. For the bigger spin, the more terms of this type you can write. So this is exercise to, to show that this is indeed projector. But what does this mean? It means that whenever you have spins, let's think in terms of energy. Suppose I have spin one here and spin one here. And what this model tells me is that if these two spins are completely aligned and form spin two, then this is bad. It costs me energy to J. But if they are not necessarily anti-aligned, but if they form a combination of spin zero or spin one, that's okay. It's, it's free, okay? So now can, can I make the state of all spins on the one-dimensional lattice in such a way that n no two neighbor spins uh, form together spin two, okay? That makes sense, question? Then if I can do that, that will be my ground state with energy zero. Okay, the way to do it is to say that spin one can be split into two spin one halves. Etc. Then let me form a state that these two spin one halves form a singlet. So like it's up down minus down up. So the total spin of these guys is zero. Then the total spin of these four is necessarily either zero or one. It cannot be two, right? You have zero plus one half plus one half. It's either zero or one. So this way I guarantee that these guys are not in the, in the state with, 
with spin 2. But then I can proceed and make the singlet state here and here, etc. Okay? Well, this is not quite correct because when I did this, these guys do not anymore form spin 1, but form something else. But let me do projector on every spin like that and project it onto spin 1. And hopefully this will not destroy anything, and you can show that it will not. And as a result, I will have some state of spins such that any two of them are in, in, a, in a state with spin not equal to. Okay? And this is, so AQLT state have exact uh, ground state, and you can calculate correlation functions of spins. And this state is kind of, uh, kind of almost obvious, it's gapful, although you need, the, the, the AQLT proves this mathematically rigorously that there is a gap, but you kind of see that to do what, anything you want, you have to break one, break one of those singlets, and, and, and that will cost you some energy of the order of J. Uh, you can show that the correlation function decays exponentially, I think it's something like three minus X, so, so with, with, uh, exponentially with X, et cetera, et cetera. So you basically kind of justify almost everything we speculated about in, in Haldane's chain and possible, and possible ground state. But remarkably, look at this. So these guys form singlet. So to break this, you really need the energy of the of J. But this is like a free guy dangling at the end. So this is spin one half that we saw in totally continuum limit from topological term. Okay. So this is the like chemical strong coupling version of the field theory computation we did before. So here you just see what it is. And it's actually chemical. This is like whatever in chemistry called covalent bonds. So, I mean, this is how singlets formed in the atoms and molecules. So this is really like chemical picture. Uh, and then this is like free electron state. Any questions? You can generalize it quite a lot. Like, for example, if you have spin two, uh, you, you can try to think about what type of projectors you have to put it to have it exactly solved. But so you basically can, but, but so there is part about this model, you can say a lot of precise things, especially uh, most recently, usually matrix product state formalism is used to, to really do computations here, and that's really elegant and nice. So, so you can do a lot of this about this model. The main conjecture, of course, is that in the phase diagram of, of the Heisenberg chain where there is coupling here and coupling here in this phase space, this model and Haldane and Heisenberg chain belongs to the same topological class. So there is no phase transition between them and both of them have gap. So this is basically, this, that's conjecture that you have to do numerically or develop some other techniques, not, not from this speculation. But this shows you the existence of this gapful uh, phase with spin halves at the ends and presumably it's in the same topological class. Okay, uh, questions? Okay, let me try to wrap up uh, just some conclusion, very quick. And I was not able to talk about full effect, no time, so maybe some other time. Uh, but fortunately, Joe and Andrea already did explain something. But of course, there are many things about quantum Hall effect. There is effect of disorder, of how you actually construct this fractional whole state, and what is the dynamics of Hall effect. So no time to talk about that. What I want to show you is that because of quantum mechanics, you can have interference. And the ultimate case of this interference is topological terms. Because even if you try to map your quantum system into statistical mechanics system to replace propagation by diffusion and to make it purely real and positive weights in the Boltzmann partition function, you still have a problem that if there is a topological term, it remains imaginary and can lead to interference. And therefore, if you have such topological term, most probably it will lead to some dramatic consequences, to some really observables, even in the, in the cases where you think that by perturbative reasons that it's, they're not important. So, that's, so we can see that two terms, topological term, which is theta term, and WZ term. 
Uh, it's not really that uh, terminology which is ac uh, accepted everywhere. So there are different names. All of them are called topological terms. Sometimes people refer, and when they say topological terms, they refer specifically to this term, and this they call just W, the Z term. So, there are, but I, I wanted to say that they are both topological in the sense that they do not depend on metric. Uh, and then uh, you can distinguish because they have really different properties. There are other topological terms, for example, topological current term. For example, you can have some gauge field multiplied by something like NVN, VN, which is, looks like made out of this, but it's what's now in three dimensions. So this is interaction of topological current with external gauge fields, which makes skirmions charged and so on and so forth. So there are other terms, uh, and they have analogy with gauge field 